I want to encourage you to stay standing for the reading of God's word. We're going to be in John chapter 10 today. John chapter 10, and we are going to be picking it up in verse 22, and we're going to be reading down to verse 30. This is the word of the Lord for our time this morning. At that time, the feast of dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you don't believe. I love that. How straightforward is Jesus? I said it, you don't believe it. That's the problem. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me. But you do not, here it is again, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Huh. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. But there's a double snatching that no one can get through because it's not just not able to snatch out of Jesus' hand. My Father, verse 29, who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the word of the Lord for this morning. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good to see you all looking so fine and dapper this uh, Memorial Day weekend. You decided not to go on vacation because this indeed is your vacation. Amen. And of course, to the live streamers out there who happen to perhaps be on vacation, we are delighted that you are with us and hope you have God's word in front of you. And let me just encourage you to grab God's word if you have it with you. John chapter 10, uh, but let's just be honest, um, we're going to be flipping today. John chapter 10, Romans chapter 8, 1 John chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter, we're going to be all over the place today. You're going to get a big systematic theology you are welcome. Before I do that, let me introduce myself. My name's Scott. I'm the lead pastor here at Doxa Church. It is a absolute joy to have you with us today. If you're new, I would love to get the opportunity to meet you. I usually hang out by the windows in the lobby out there. Come say hi. If you're wanting to connect, I would love to connect with you. And let me just encourage you, kind of a double setup here. If you're not going to that marriage seminar and you are married, shame on you. Okay? Get to that seminar. Dave Harvey's become a dear friend, and what he has to share is going to be critical for you. And so we're trying to get every impediment out of the way. But let me just encourage you, get there. Somehow, someway, make it next week. you got plans, try to cancel them. It's worth it to invest in your marriage. I don't care if it's been 35 years in your marriage or four years in your marriage. You need it, and God's providing it for you next weekend, okay? So get there, sign up. That would be fabulous. We're in this series, uh, if you don't know uh, or are new to Doxa, called Now Concerning. It's the language that Paul uses in the second half of 1 Corinthians to respond to a bunch of questions that the church in Corinth had that Pastor Paul was kind of answering. And I thought, let's do that here uh, in the 21st century. I think that might be fruitful and beneficial to us. And so you guys responded back. We whittled that list down to the nine most pressing questions you have in this day. And we are uh, approaching topic number six today. Six of nine. Can you believe it? We're moving through. Today's message, now concerning losing your salvation. Now concerning losing your salvation. I feel like maybe the most important place to start is what do I mean by salvation, right? 
Because that's kind of a churchy word. And if you're not, you know, you haven't grown up in the church, salvation can kind of be vague. So let me just be, see if I'm crystal clear about uh, salvation. When we talk about losing your salvation, can you lose your salvation? We're talking about Christians who have turned from their sin, put their faith in Jesus Christ, right? You are saved from sin, of which we all have sin, because we are sinners born in sin, and we commit commit sin, every single one of us, and you and I, regardless of what your background is, what your religious affiliation is, or lack thereof, you need to be saved from your sin. You need to be saved from your sin and its effects. You need to be saved by God, from God, through God, to God. That's what you need. That is the most pressing reality in your life today, regardless of what you thought it was walking in here, okay? And the question is, for the truly born again believer in Jesus Christ, can you lose your salvation and ultimately perish in your sin? That's what we're going to talk about today. Now, There is a theological progression to this. I don't know if you're seeing the thread that's kind of weaving its way through the past couple weeks. We did predestination last week, right? And let me just just unfold this thread for you. If you have a man-centered view of predestination, which is the more comfortable view of predestination for many, especially because as Christians, new Christians, we come out of the gate man-centered. If you choose to take a man-centered approach to predestination, it demands a dismantling of the doctrine of eternal security. So you can choose what game you want to play. If you want to go the route of man getting the final say as to whether or not you are truly regenerated, that you got yourself in, listen, if you are the final say on getting yourself in, then you can most certainly get yourself out. Okay? But the reason that people go that route, the more man-centered route, that man has the final say in their salvation, I'm talking about the regeneration aspect of their salvation, is because that's more comfortable than saying God in his grace ultimately has the say. However, if you go that comforting route, you don't get the better end of the doctrine of eternal security. And so it's a Give and take, it's a plug and play, but praise be to God. We talked about last week, salvation belongs to the Lord. And it is by grace, and it is in no way dependent upon you. And so we're going to see how a right view of predestination leads to a right view of understanding, can you lose your salvation? But I also want to say from my heart, from a pastor's perspective, reading these questions of all the questions of all of the weeks we're doing this, this one was the most heartbreaking to me because the questions read like testimonies. We asked for like a sentence. You guys gave me like a life story. And some of you, you're you're struggling because you walked away from the Lord and now you're trying to figure yourself out and am I saved or was I saved and where am I and I'm concerned and you're lacking assurance and there's a part of my pastoral heart that I hope today I can communicate uh, faithfully about assurance. But then there's others in the room. You asked the question and you told me a story about your friend or your family member. You remember the one that you're like, legit, I was there when they gave their life to Christ and they now no longer want anything to do with Jesus Christ. You remember that? I had people by the droves writing in and saying that, telling us, testifying to that on the questions. And so I just recognize that today there needs to be a pastoral emphasis and I'm I'm praying to God that he will give me that today because this should be a doctrine of comfort to your hearts and a doctrine of confidence that we can trust the Lord for those who are still outstanding in their having walked away from the Lord. So that being said, let me frame it, and, um, and then we'll get into the outline, okay? Here are some of the questions that came in. What happens to those who commit to Christ and then walk away? We're seeing a lot of that these days, aren't we? What if Christians stop believing? They just stop. You had someone in your life like that, just stopped believing? How do you know if you were saved or not saved if you stepped away from Jesus? 
I'm imagining that means for a time. Can a person who is truly saved lose their salvation? That's the question, isn't it? That's the overarching question. Can a person who is truly saved, born again by the Spirit of God, truly regenerated, can they lose their salvation? This message, some of these messages are complex, right? There's a lot of pieces. Uh, the outline and the big idea for today's message is the answer to the question crystal, crystal clear, okay? So if you're like, he was saying that thing, and about the, and I, what, what, what was it? Just write down the big idea, point one and point two, and you'll have everything you need, okay? So can a person who is truly saved lose their salvation? That's the essence of today. Here's the big idea. Ready? You would if you could, but you can't, so you won't. <laughs> it's even catchy. You could sing a song about that. You would if you could. That's probably an important part to understand. You would if you could. We would all succeed at losing it if we could, but you can't, so you won't. Okay? How joyful is that? You're like, left to me, you would, if you could, but you can't, so you won't. And here's the simplicity of the outline, okay? Here is the simplicity of the outline. If you lose it, you never had it. Number two, if you have it, you'll never lose it. Let's pray. <laughs> Let's just, right? But I got a meal, you know, I got to feed you guys. You got to be missionaries to the world. I can't give you that. What was that, like a crouton and water? I mean, I got I to gotta get you more than that. So don't worry, we'll break this down, but this is it. I'm telling you, don't get lost today. You would if you could, but you can't, so you won't. If you lose it, you never had it. If you have it, you'll never lose it, okay? So let's do it. Number one, if you lose it, you never had it. If you lose it, you never had it. Let's, ch let's chat about this. The Bible seems to indicate that there's two kinds of falls, okay? Two kinds of falls. Both kinds of falls can seem like salvation is being lost, but there's a difference. One type of fall is temporary. The other type of fall is total. The difference between a temporary fall and a total fall. Let's take a case study of this, and let's use Peter and Judah, shall we? Good examples? Peter and Judas uh, both sinned in a very similar sense. Uh, both sins were severe or serious. You have Judas denying Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. You have Peter denying Jesus Christ. Think about how eerily similar that is. Okay, that makes part of the entire conversation today so freaky and hard to judge in people because ultimately we don't know their hearts. It's what's so concerning about Matthew chapter 7, which I think to the American church is one of the most pressing, needed passages that we must understand. That many people on that day will say, Lord, Lord, do we not do all these mighty things in your name? Do we not have the Jesus bumper sticker? Did I not pull the coffee mug out in the morning with the Bible verse on it and was not my Hobby Lobby sign in every children's bedroom? And he will say to you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Listen to the language, it's so important. I never knew you. Not, I knew you once and then I unknew you. Not, I knew you once, but then you walked away from me and stopped knowing me. I never knew you. Never. So inevitably, there are going to be people, perhaps in the midst of the church, our church even, who will testify to being a Christian, who will look like a Christian, who will in many external realities seem like they're a Christian, and Jesus will have never known them. This is the story of Judas, is it not? 
Judas had a lot of things on the outside that made him look like a believer. Um, you don't entrust, he was the team treasurer. You guys know that, right? Um, just, just simple wisdom here. You don't entrust the shady guy to the bills. You know what I'm talking about? Okay, that guy doesn't get to hold the money. Evidently, Judas gets to be the money guy and no disciple has an issue with that. Furthermore, when you go on in the story into Matthew chapter 26 and Jesus brings up the reality that one of them was going to betray him, do you remember that? You know what the disciples' response wasn't? Oh, Jesus, that's easy. It's that shady dude, Judas. <laughs> no, what do, you, what do they say? Is it me? Listen, if Judas was so outwardly shady that it was obvious that he wasn't really following Jesus, wouldn't they just all said it was him? Like, obviously, it's that guy. But that's not at all what happened. They wonder if it's themselves. They're not even putting it together. See how eerily similar this is. Peter denies Christ. Judas betrays Christ. It can look so similar. What is the difference? Here's the difference. Peter is restored by means of repentance. Luke 22 Jesus prays for Peter in verse 32, and he prays that his faith will not fail, he says. I pray that your faith will not fail. And then he doesn't say, and if you turn, strengthen your brothers. And then say that. He says, and when you turn, strengthen your brothers. When, not if. Jesus was praying for Peter to persevere. That's a lot of peas. <laughs> Peter is an encouraging side for the believer because what, he's, what the Bible is clear on is true believers may fail. They, you will fail. You will falter. You may even walk in a season of impenitence, impenitent or unrepentant sin for a season and become best friends with the elders. And that's one of the blessings of church discipline, by the way. So many churches don't practice church discipline. We do because we believe in the restoration of the believer to the body. It's church discipline that's in part to keep people who claim to be Christians from going from a temporary fall to a total fall, right? This is the goal of church discipline, that when we see someone in sin, what do we do? When they've sinned against us, we go to them. They don't listen, we bring another witness. If they're still not repentant, we tell it to the church. And if need be, we remove them and treat them as an unbeliever, that even in the presence and in the hands of Satan, they may awaken to the reality of just how far they have fallen and if true believers will turn from their sin and be restored to fellowship with the church. Church discipline is in part to help keep that total fall from being a, excuse me, a t temporary fall from being a total fall. That's part of the purpose of church discipline. And when believers are pressed about their sin, it may be a season that they don't respond, but eventually they respond, they repent, and they are restored. Unbelievers, on the other hand, don't showing that whatever they had before was never actually genuine. That's what I'm going for. Never actually genuine to begin with. That's the hard part. That's the offensive part. People struggle with that piece of it. The term for that person, the unbeliever, showing that they never had faith to begin with, the term for that individual is an apostate. That's the language of scripture. An apostate is someone who, it means to stand away from. You reach a position, and then you abandon that position decisively and irreversibly. And perhaps no more clear of a verse in all of scripture for that is 1 John chapter 2. And we've actually preached the book of 1 John. And John's dealing with this reality inside of the church and in 1 John chapter 2, verse 19, if you guys want to look at it, you're more than welcome to. Here's what John says. 
He says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. Went out from us, weren't of us. For if they were, had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that it might become plain that they are all not of us. So there's going to be some that are with us that are not of us. And then they're going to go out, and in their going out, it's going to become plain that they were all not of us. In other words, what he's saying is a faith proven false is a faith never true in the first place. Now, this is where it hits really close to home because um, deconstructionism is in these days. Is it not? Are you following this? Do you understand the word when I'm saying it? Give me a nod if you know what I'm saying by deconstructionism. Not enough nods, so I'm going to keep going to explain it. I don't want you to miss it. It's um, people that are taking the Christian faith and deconstructing the Christian faith, their beliefs about the Christian faith, and ultimately detaching themselves from the Christian faith. That's really what it is. So there's been this slew of famous people. I don't know if you guys heard about this. Was it two weeks ago that um, we just introduced our kids recently to DC Talk? What would people do if they thought that I was a Jesus? You remember that one? Just like that, right? Just like that. <laughs> and, uh, and Kevin Max, one of the singers, uh, just wanted everyone to know on social media that he had become, quote, an ex-evangelical. It's actually trending on Twitter to be an ex-evangelical. Let me just be really, really clear even about that term. If you persist in the state of being an ex-evangelical, you are a nevangelical. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm dead serious. The people who think they're leaving the faith, they were never in the faith to begin with. Um, it's sad. It's not all the same situation. John Piper's own son has come out on TikTok and developed a following of like a million people basically shredding the faith that he grew up with that I know was sound from his own home. You got Paul Maxwell, who is the professor at Moody Bible Institute, who is deconstructing his faith and walking away from the Lord. You've got Josh Harris, who is a megachurch pastor, who wrote a great book on theology, ironically called Dug Down Deep. Also wrote a book called I Kiss Dating Goodbye. And apparently he did to his faith as well. There's a lot of concerns. One of the things that becomes clear is the whole uh, deconstructing yourself from your faith uh, does not depend on merely having a bad evangelical theological background. It can happen in good places as well. However, I want to warn, especially within the culture that we live in, in this very area, there are some massive problems leading to some massive issues that the church, our next generation of church, is going to have to deal with. And one of the issues with that is this faulty understanding of decisional regeneration. That is causing terrible harm to the church. That because you walked an aisle or prayed a prayer, everyone's telling you you're saved? That you have nothing to worry about? That for sure you're a Christian? Just repeat after me? With your eyes closed and your head still bowed, I see you, brother. God bless you. I see even some didn't raise their hand today. You're saved too. And listen, you're like, why? Well, that's not how they say it. No, but it's implied by it. It's implied by it. That is causing problems all over the place. It's causing all kinds of different issues. I'll give you some examples of some of the byproducts of this decisional regeneration. You raise your hand and you're saved. You've got multi-conversion man. They're like superheroes. Multi-conversion man. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? He's raised his hand 600 times to the gospel. Okay? It's padding the stats at every local church that does that. Like a bazillion people got saved, and Kenny's like, 600 of those are me. You count every one of them. He's there every week raising his hand. He has no idea what makes him Christian, but just in case he lost it from Sunday to Sunday, he'll raise his hand again. And then you have the people who are cornered by some zealous Christian that was like, you're going to hell, and I can help you really, really quick get this all over with. Flames forever, or just say seven words after me, 
and you're good. It's like Monopoly. I will give you a get out of hell free card. And, we, and they're like, fine, that sounds great. I'm in. And they pray the prayer and they are convinced. There are so many people walking around in churches in our backyard, perhaps here. There have been many of that in our church who think they are Christian and you are not Christian. But you were told you were a Christian. It was implied that you were a Christian. And my heart breaks because there are so many people thinking they're going to heaven and they are not going to heaven. Not at this point. There's such a thing as profession without possession. You can profess all day long. You go, well, they showed fruit. I mean, I saw it. I saw them change. You know there's fruit in the parable of the sower? Excuse me, I should take a step back. There's signs of fruit coming in the parable of the sower. The grain doesn't come, but you know the one on rocky ground shoots up out of the ground? The roots are shallow, but it comes out. So you're going, there was a time when I could have sworn I saw something. And you're like, okay, well, maybe that was the reality like Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower. You may have seen something, but it doesn't mean it's genuine. We'll talk about how to determine the difference in a little bit. The question, though, is what do we do with these people in our lives right now? Scott, some of this is not comforting. What do we do in our lives how do we judge where someone is if they do walk away from the Lord or where they're at? Here's what, I, here's what I know. I don't know how to judge the heart, and nor are we supposed to, but here's what I know. Whether they've walked away from the faith and they're still genuinely Christians in a season of unrepentance or they're truly just not a believer, the answer is the same. You need to preach the gospel to them. They need to repent of their sin and return to Jesus Christ as their Savior. So it doesn't really matter how you look at it. And for the person you're like, I've preached the gospel till my voice is hoarse to this person. Here's what you do. Pray and have a patient trust in God. Because listen to me, loved ones, for that friend, for that family member, for that brother, for that sister, if they are truly regenerated, it is not if they turn, but when they turn. And God wants you to serve in that, praise God but you can trust him and you ought to be praying that God would restore them. He is able to do that. Yeah, well, what about, yeah, well, what about this verse and what about this verse and what about this verse and this verse says that you can be a Christian and lose your salvation. What about that? Should we do the whatabouts? You want to do that? Okay, because I prepared a whatabout section. Okay. <laughs> so, so there's always the whatabouts that, that misunderstand a portion of scripture and use it to say, see, believers can lose their salvation, right? They're like, well, what about 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22? Uh, uh, well, well, what about uh, 1 Timothy 1, 18 to 20? And I wish I, if I had four hours, I'd, do, I'd exposit every one of those passages and show you that's not what it's saying. But let's just go for the big dog. Who, 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 Hebrews 6, right? Hebrews 6, Everybody's favorite. See, that's where you can lose your salvation. Hebrews 6. He's, no, there's no way you can get out of Hebrews 6. Okay, let's go to Hebrews 6. Let's, let's, let's hang out there for just a little bit. We've got a lot to go through. We've got a lot of verses. You would if you could, but you can't, so you won't. Just throwing that in for a little nug. Just short for nugget. Come on, get with the times, people. Get with the times. It's more expedient to say nug than nugget. We all know that. All right, Hebrews 6, verse 4. For it is impossible. <gasps> ah! In the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and shared in the Holy Spirit and tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away. See? To restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. See, Pastor Scott, this is the go-to, you can lose your salvation text. Well, I hate to burst your bubble if you're on that page, but what you thought was the go-to, how to lose your salvation text, is actually a stern warning to press them on to persevere in the faith text. And I'll show you that. 
There is a warning here. There's no doubt about it. And just as God leverages many warnings in the word, God implies this combination between warning and consolation as a means, guys. This is the word, means. God has a means of preserving us. He has a means of helping, enabling his people to endure. And one of those means is a warning. That's what this passage is. And the ones who make this passage about losing your salvation change the function of the passage by converting the warning against falling away into a declaration that it's possible to fall away. And you do that and you butcher this text. First of all, he says in chapter 6, verse 4, for it is possible, and then he says, in the case of. He's speaking hypothetically. In the case of. Let's just go there. He's warning them because they're tiptoeing, they're getting awfully close to this reality. They're struggling with this Judaizing heresy to leave the gospel and go back to the old covenant to be bound by the works of the law and so the freedom that's made possible through faith alone in Jesus Christ. And so he says in the case of the one who is enlightened and tasted and shared in and then turned back with full knowledge about Jesus Christ, he's saying you would be repudiating the finished work of Jesus, thus, in a sense, crucifying him all over again. He is not saying that any true believer does actually fall away. He's not saying that. In fact, he says the exact opposite. And one of the things that I often say, and if you ever get in a pickle, Christian, and they, they're throwing down the, see, Hebrews 6, Hi-ya! I got you, you're dead meat. All I would just say is don't get nervous or a little bit prideful in that moment like you're stuck. My encouragement is just keep reading the passage. Don't ever feel like you have to defend the word. The word will defend itself. I'm never nervous. I've not been nervous after one of these messages about someone coming up and confronting me in the lobby and going, you got something off. There's no doubt some things that I'll have off in time. I'm not saying I have it all right, but I'm not afraid of standing on something as if it's my belief. It's thus saith the Lord, and his word can defend himself. And, and, and if, if I need to change, we can submit unto that. And that's how we should all live. So I'm not worried because I'm trying to, as plainly as possible, seek to live under the word of the Lord. If you just keep reading the passage, you will see the very point of this. Look at Hebrews 6, verse 9. So he continues on, gives you the sense and the point of why he's given this warning. He says, in spite of all those things, that it's in the case of those who have once been enlightened, have shared in this, and then fallen away to restore them again to repentance, like hint, hint, warn, because you would be crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm. Listen to this, verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of what? Better things. Things that belong to? Oh! Oh! Biblical mic drop. He's not saying they're losing their salvation. He's not saying they have lost their salvation or that you even could lose your salvation. He's saying you're getting awfully close to doing something that you need to be sternly warned for. For if you walk out of step with the gospel, you will be repudiating the work of Jesus. And he says, but I am convinced of better things concerning you, things that belong to salvation. What are those better things? Well, you see the evidences of the fruit of salvation in verse 10, genuine fruit, your work and the love you've shown for his name and serving the saints. We see this assurance of hope in verse 11. And here's the whole point of the passage in verse 12. You ready? So that you may not be sluggish. He wants the church to persevere. Don't be sluggish. There are so many things that are gonna pull you away from the gospel. Keep getting after the gospel. Don't be sluggish. You go, well, that's not, well, well, if the true believer can't fully fall away, why even bother to warn them in the first place? Here's why, because perseverance of the saints is a grace and a duty. That's where we're gonna go. 
meaning you participate in your persevering in the faith. And here's what so often God uses these warnings as a means to cause us to persevere as we obey, but also it's a means of gaining assurance because the ones who respond to the warning, guess what we find out about them? They're Christians. They're Christians. And the one who doesn't respond to the warning, what do we see? They weren't Christians to begin with. And I'm talking about this, of course, in a final, full, and permanent sense, not in a sense of one moment they're not thinking this way and then they return. That was the whole point of earlier. My encouragement to you, passages that look like we can lose our salvation are usually and typically biblical warnings working as a means to our perseverance. That's what those are. Okay? If you lose it, you never had it. And I mean that finally and completely. I'm not talking about temporarily lose it, okay? Am I clear on that? Because I might be preaching with a little bit of an assumption there, and I don't want you to hear me saying lose it, and you're in a state right now with a brother, or sister, or family member, or friend who has lost it. I'm not talking about you don't know where they are right now. And I told you the same thing's true. We pray, we're patient, and we preach repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? But I'm talking about in that final full sense, if you lose it, you never had it. Now, let's flip it and talk about if you have it, you'll never lose it, number two, okay? If you have it, you'll never lose it. If you have it, you'll never lose it. This is the doctrine for the record. When you talk about losing your salvation, that's not really a category. It's a question that's come up because of some distinctions and differences in doctrine. But um, the whole idea of losing your salvation falls under the category of the doctrine of eternal security. That's the bigger category. So we're going to nerd out a little bit and talk about the doctrine of eternal security from the two perspectives that we should talk about it from. One is preservation of the saints. And the other is the perseverance of the saints. Oh, both those words are so important. Preservation, that sound like something you do? Preservation of the saints versus perseverance of the saints. Both aspects are important. Preservation is what God does. And perseverance is what we do. I'm going to show you preservation. I'm going to show you perseverance. This is what gets confusing in this whole lose your salvation thing. And then we're just going to work it out. How do they work out together? Okay? That's where we're going. So, preservation. This is what God does. You want to jot this down as a subpoint. Preservation. God will preserve his own. He will. And all God's people said, ah, the best. We should walk with a limpy, humble swagger of confidence in the Lord's grace. So John 10, there's a lot of places we could go. John 10, we read it earlier. God will preserve his own. I love John 10. Jesus is so clear. They're speaking clearly. Jesus is answering clearly. My sheep, verse 27, hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I love that sound. It's one of the best parts. Just every once in a while, when you hear people turning their pages, just listen to it and go, praise God, there's an entire group of people turning pages of the Bible at church. That's how it should be. Okay. Come on, guys. Some of you still haven't found it? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> we judge a little bit here, okay? A little bit. Uh, okay, verse 28, I give them eternal life. Yeah, baby. John 3:36 already said whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. 
He gives eternal life and they will, I love it, it's a double down. I give eternal life. Oh, and just in case you didn't understand what that meant, they will never perish. People sometimes seem to think that God gives eternal life, but then you can lose eternal life. Well, listen, if you could learn lose eternal life, which I don't know if you know what eternal means, but it means forever. If you could lose eternal life, it's temporary life. That's what Jesus gave you. He gave you temporary life. That is a buzzkill of promise. It also weakens the whole and point of Jesus' assurance right here, right? I give you eternal life, but you could butcher it. Nope, 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 no. Verse 28, no one will snatch them out of my hand, a double snatch, I love this. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. That seems clear. Who's going to win on that death grip competition? God's going to win. Why? Because he's greater than all. And yet the defense on the other side of the argument for yes, you can lose your salvation is they grant, this is humorous, they grant, you're right, no one can snatch them out of the Father's hand, but you can somehow slither your way out of the Father's hand. (laughs) It's really impressive, but you can do that. No one else can snatch you out of the Father's hand, but you, my friend, are slimy and you can get through. Which I think is, what an audacious thing to say. How much pride is in that comment? First of all, are you not included in the no one? No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. No one but me, really. You can, sna- you can sl- slip out of the Father's hand, but nobody else can. I-, I-, I hate to break it to you, but if that's where you are, no one includes you. Not to match- mention the function of the passage falls woefully short if the possibility remained that we could remove ourselves from Christ's hand that would hardly give this passage the assurance Jesus intended. Let me just read it to you. This would be awesome. Um, My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hand unless you slip out yourself. Let that fortify your backbone. You're like, I'm not sure that's what's supposed to do that. The whole book of John has so much about the keeping grace of God, right? You could go forward in the book of John. There are are passages all over the place that speak of God's preserving grace over our lives. The entire prayer, the high priestly prayer, is essentially built off this idea of Jesus praying that we will be kept by God fully and completely so we can experience that being united to him in faith. John 17, Jesus himself says, I have kept them in your name and I have guarded them and have lost no one except the son of perdition. Oh, that was Judas, by the way. Now, let me run through a few just for fun. First Peter 1, 3 to 5. I love the language here because it fits very much with the picture of what we need because of our status in our own depravity like we talked about last week. He has caused us to be born again. How's that language? He caused us to be born again. That's 1 Peter 1, verse 3, to a living hope. And to an inheritance, he says. Verse 5, he says, you who by God's power are being guarded, similar idea from John 17, but a different word, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You are being guarded. I love this word. This word can mean both you are kept from escaping and you are protected from attack. It can go both ways, and I think it does. Richard Sibbs, the Puritan, once said, not only is our inheritance kept for us, but we are kept for it. Twofold. I'm going to end in Romans 8 here. I'm I'm going to go there in a second. I'm going to rattle off some verses. It's one of our favorite verses. It's definitely coffee cup worthy. Uh, Philippians 1.6, does everyone know it? And I'm confident of this, that what? He who began a 
good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Everyone cool with that one? That one okay? Uh, what about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8? Do you remember when we were in it? We don't need to go there. You have it memorized, right, from, the, from our year and a half in the book? No? It says that God will sustain you to the end. That sounds like preservation. Uh, we read a section of Ephesians 1 all the way to verse 14 of chapter 1 last week, and we said that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, sealed for the day of, of redemption, he who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. He's the down to pay. He's the earnest deposit. He is the assurance that we will acquire possession of that inheritance in the future to the praise of his glorious grace. How much are we praising the Holy Spirit if he might lose some of us because we slither? It's all about him. He's sustaining us. He's preserving us. It should change the way we worship. You won't get there. He'll get you there. Not in your own strength. Romans 8. Whew. Has it really been 43? It feels like 23 minutes. I guess I got to speed this up a little bit. We've been going long. It doesn't matter. Here we go. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. If that doesn't light up your soul, I don't know what else will. Breathe, church of God. Let the Holy Spirit refresh your heart on what just was said. The justified, those whom he justified, he also glorified. Which, by the way, has glorification happened yet? Why is Paul talking about it in the past tense? Because he's so stinking sure about the decrees of God, he speaks about it in the past tense about something that's going to happen in the future. That's how certain it is. If he's predestined you, he'll call you a factual call. If he's called you, he'll justify you. And all those who are justified is the implication he will glorify. This is an incredible text of confidence for the one who needs to hear God will preserve you. But then there's another aspect, and this is where it gets confusing for people. Perseverance is what we do. God preserves us, but we are to persevere in the faith. How does that work? Let me give you just a few basic understandings here. First of all, true Christians, they do persevere to the end. Or you could say it like this, only those who persevere to the end have been truly born again. That's a pretty important statement. Only those who persevere to the end in the faith have been born again. They may have some bumps, they may have some seasons, but they will persevere ultimately to the end. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 8, if you continue in my word, you truly are my disciples. Hebrews 3, 14, we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. Colossians 1, 23, if indeed, this is how he says it in Colossians 1, Paul says, if indeed you continue in the faith, not shifting from the, go the hope of the gospel, so we went from God's preserving us to we, sounds like we're doing a lot here. Sounds like we're, we're a part of this. This is where the picture of salvation gets really interesting. Remember I was talking about monergism versus synergism last week and in the regenerative, regenerative work of God, we're talking about a monergistic work of the spirit. But when it comes to your persevering in the faith and your growth and sanctification, that is a synergistic reality where you, I'll give you Paul's work, Work harder than anybody, though not you, but the grace of God working through you. That is the Christian life. 
God wants you, listen to me, God wants you to work as hard as you can with all of your might by the power of the Holy Spirit to persevere. He wants you to. Like, what if God's preserving me? No, no, listen, they're both true at the same time. God is preserving you, and one of the means God uses to preserve you is to command you to persevere. By his grace. You need to work harder than anybody, though not you, but the grace of God working through you. This is a Trinitarian work. God's preserving means for your perseverance is a Trinitarian work. The Father keeping you and preserving you. The Son sustaining you and interceding for you. And the Spirit indwelling and sealing you. Now, if you want to get to where all this comes together like this awesome PBJ, we're going to put it all together right now. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. This is where we'll close. So you can go there. Philippians chapter 2, 12 and 13. It's like, how does all this work together? Here's how it works together. We'll get some application and we will be done. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, listen to this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. See, it totally makes sense. You need to work out what God is working in. Uh huh. That's it. You need to ditch this faulty version of let go and let God that somehow gets into your understanding of persevering in the faith. Listen, let go and let God is not a terrible saying, but it's one of those that like, unless you're talking about control, you need to give up to the Lord. You need to get after it when it comes to your perseverance. Don't let go and let God get after it by the power of the Holy Spirit with everything that you have. The words of 2 Peter 1.10, be all the more diligent, be diligent about it to confirm your calling and election for if you practice these things, you will never fall. God's means of preserving us is calling us to practice these things, growing in the faith, continuing in the faith. We work out what God's working in over and over, day after day, and God's preserving us. Yeah, but we're persevering. Yeah, but he's using it as a means to preserve you. Well, what if I have a struggle of the season? I decide to let go of God's hands. You can't get out of his. And the Christian returns, repents, and responds again to the word. And so here's what you need to be seeing. You want to see a life of a Christian in you you need to see someone who's continuing in the faith and bearing fruit. That's what you need to see. You need to see someone who's continuing in the faith and bearing fruit. There's a phrase that comes up sometimes called once saved, always saved. And it's not wrong, but man, I think it's, it's woefully inadequate as a motivation to persevere. I think people use that phrase, well, once saved, always saved, as a cop-out instead of a fuel for greater godliness. I think it promotes this casual Christianity where somehow we have an entire portion of the body that's too busy for church, that's too busy for God, that's too busy for the gospel, that's too busy, I hadn't had a conversation about Jesus with anyone in like eons, but hey, once saved, always saved. The, the doctrine of eternal security is going to press you on that and say, no, you need to continue in the faith. How do you continue? Continue by consuming Christ through his word and consume the word of God. You continue by consumption, conversation, contrition, and commands. You continue by consuming Jesus. You continue by conversation with God. You continue by contrition or repentance over your sins, and you continue by obeying God's commands. Uh, 
And we're looking for fruit. Fruit of the Spirit, fruit of a transformed life, fruit of greater holiness, fruit of a greater affection for Jesus. But listen, we're not playing the short-term game, we're playing the long-term game. The question is, do I see a long-term pattern of spiritual growth? You gotta see that. Are you persevering with everything in you? God's preserving You're persevering. So can you lose your salvation? No. Needs to be said once. No. It's been explained, but it needs to be said. No, you can't. And maybe I'll just leave us with the words of Jude 24 and 25. And I'll even use this, and we're going to transition into a time of communion, and we're going to take communion together. Um, One of the words that I got in my study this week was from John Flavel, who was a Puritan, and he asked this question, did God finish his work for us? Did God finish his work for us? Answer, then he will also finish his work in us. Did he finish his work for us? Answer, it is finished, so yes. Then we can have confidence, loved ones, that he'll finish his work in us, and so we're gonna come to the table to be reminded of the fact that he finished his work for us. And so as you come to the table today, you're reminded of the fact that he's going to finish his work, tell me, in you. We're going to remember the body of Jesus was nailed to a cross. We're going to remember his blood that was shed for our sins so that at the name of Jesus and this declaration of his person and work, living a life we didn't live, dying a death we should have died and rising for our salvation physically, bodily, he extended the invitation that all who would trust in him by faith, trust in Jesus Christ alone, would be forgiven of their sins, would be assured of eternal life, would be reconciled to God in right relationship with him. And so we're gonna celebrate that. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read Jude 24 and 25 over us as kind of our transition. And then what I want you to do is come and get the elements, grab your bread, grab your cup, it's up here, and then sit down and we're going to take communion together. But let this be the word as we come to the table reminding ourselves of Jesus' finished work for us, that he will finish the work in us. Here's what Jude says. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling... and to present you blameless before the presence of God, before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Come and take when you're ready. Ben, Pastor Ben will lead us.